Good afternoon. Uh, we have just uh, finished a substantive uh, meeting of NATO foreign ministers. We agreed uh, that we must further strengthen and sustain our support to Ukraine so that Ukraine prevails in the face of uh, Russia's invasion. We agreed uh, that we must support uh, other regional partners under pressure and we agreed to step up cooperation with our partners in the Asia-Pacific because the crisis has global ramifications. Allies utterly condemned uh, the horrific murders uh, of civilians we have seen in Butsha and uh, other places uh, recently liberated from Russian control. All the facts must be established. All those responsible for these atrocities must be brought to justice. And allies are supporting efforts uh, for an international investigation. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Koleba thanked NATO allies uh, for their substantial support. Allies have been doing a lot and are determined to do more, now and for the medium and longer term, to help the brave Ukrainians defend their homes and their country and push back the invading forces. Allies are also supporting uh, and stepping up uh, humanitarian aid and financial uh, support. We discussed what more uh, we will do, including cyber security assistance and providing equipment to help Ukraine protect against chemical and biological uh, threats. Allies agreed that we should also uh, help other partners to strengthen their resilience and shore up their uh, ability to defend themselves including Georgia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. For Georgia, uh, we could increase our support through the substantial NATO Georgia package, including in areas like situational awareness, secure communications and cyber. For Bosnia and Herzegovina, we could develop a new defense uh, capacity building package. Any assistance would be tailored, demand-driven and delivered uh, with the full consent of the countries uh, concerned. Today, we were also joined uh, by Georgia, Finland, Sweden and the European Union, as well as NATO's Asia-Pacific partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand and the Republic of Korea. Because the implications of Russia's invasions are global and will be long-lasting, and what is happening in Ukraine is being closely watched around the world. We have seen that China is unwilling to condemn Russia's aggression. And Beijing has joined Moscow in questioning the right of nations to choose their own path. This is a serious challenge to us all. And it makes it even more important that we stand together to protect our values. NATO and our Asia-Pacific partners have now agreed to step up our practical and political cooperation in several areas, including cyber, new technology and countering disinformation. We will also work more closely uh, together in other areas such as maritime security, climate change and resilience, because global challenges demand global solutions. Ministers also addressed our future relations with Russia. The sanctions introduced by NATO allies and our partners are unprecedented. And they are uh, uh, damaging President Putin's war machine. We need to continue coordinated pressure to help end this senseless war. Ministers agreed that NATO's next strategic concept must deliver a response on how we relate to Russia in the future. And for the first time, it must also take account of how China's growing influence and coercive policies affect our security. The strategic concept will be finalized for the Madrid summit in June. It will be the roadmap for the alliance's continued adaptation for the more dangerous and competitive world we live in. Finally, Allies approved the Charter for our Defence Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, or DIANA. To start, it will include a network of around 60 innovation sites in North America and Europe. 
Working with the private sector, academia, allies will ensure that we can harness the best of new technology for transatlantic security. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. We'll start with the Wall Street Journal, second row. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dan Michaels, Wall Street Journal. Um, Minister Kaleba uh, said this morning and this afternoon that his agenda here was weapons, 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 and this afternoon said he needs the, the Ukraine needs them faster. He's concerned about the speed of the delivery of the weapons. Um, what can you say about what you and the NATO partners are doing to accelerate deliveries, if, if that is the case? And especially since, as you have said, as he said, the scale of the fighting is, that looks set to happen in Donbass will just be on a whole other level from what we've seen before. Is Ukraine ready for that kind of fight? Thank you. Let me just start by reminding everyone on that uh, NATO allies and NATO have supported uh, Ukraine for many years. Uh, after the illegal annexation of Crimea and uh, Russia's first invasion in 2014, uh, also into Donbass, uh, NATO allies and NATO have provided significant support with uh, equipment, with training. Tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers have been trained. And then uh, uh, when we saw the intelligence indicating uh, a highly likely invasion. Uh, Allies stepped up uh, last autumn and uh, uh, this winter. Then after the inv uh, invasion, Allies have stepped up with uh, additional uh, military support, with more military equipment. And it was a clear message from the meeting today that Allies uh, uh, should do more and are ready to do more, to provide more equipment, and they uh, realize and, and, and recognize the urgency. So this is actually one of the reasons why it was important to have uh, Minister Koleba at the meeting, uh, and we are uh, closely uh, uh, coordinating, uh, working with, uh, sorry, discussing these issues with uh, with um, uh, with uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, and of course the different meetings we have uh, helps us also to be uh, informed about their needs. So allies uh, are providing uh, and are ready to do more when it comes to military support. Al Jazeera. I'm Steph Fauser from Al Jazeera English. You uh, speak about more weapons, right? Does it mean in quantity, or are you talking about a different kind of weapon, more, as we call it, in a more offensive weapon? And how do you think Russia was, is going to respond to that? That's my first question. And secondly, I would like to ask your comments on this video that has emerged where uh, Ukrainian forces appear to be uh, killing uh, Russian uh, soldiers that have been uh, captured already. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I, I fully uh, uh, understand that you are asking specific questions about specific uh, types of weapons. At the same time, uh, I, I, I think it's important to understand that uh, uh, allies uh, 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 believe uh, it is better often to not be specific exactly uh, about what kind of systems uh, but, uh, but rest assured, allies are providing a wide range of different weapon systems, uh, both uh, uh, Soviet-era systems, but also modern uh, equipment. Uh, and uh, I think that this distinction between offensive and defensive is a bit strange, because we speak about providing weapons to a country which is defending itself. Uh, and and self-defense is a right which is enshrined in the UN Charter. So uh, everything Ukraine does, with the support from NATO allies, is defensive, because they are defending themselves. Uh, and, uh, and of course, they need different types of weapons. Um, and the uh, allies are providing them with different types of weapons. And we see the impact uh, of uh, these weapons uh, on the background every day. Uh, because the Ukrainians have been able to inflict severe uh, losses on uh, the invading Russian uh, forces. Then I would say that uh, uh, every report on potential violations of, uh, uh, of uh, <coughs> national law uh, should be uh, uh, thoroughly uh, looked into. Uh, and of course, any violation of, uh, of uh, international law and any war crime is always unacceptable. But I cannot comment on that specific video because I don't know anything about that specific uh, incident. We'll go to Deutsche Welle, Ukraine, in the third row. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much, Yuri Sheko Deutsche Welle. Um, one more question about weapons. Uh, I'm not asking what, when, and how. Of course not. I'm not asking about those specifics. But can you say uh, the, so to say, uh, the line within NATO? Are there any exclusions of the types of weapons that NATO allies are ready to provide? As we heard a couple of weeks ago during the NATO summit, like Macron was saying, that tanks and jets are out of the question. Or can you say that? Now there are no exclusions of uh, the types of systems that can be provided to Ukraine. Thank you very much. So again, if I start to be specific uh, in my answer to that type of questions, I actually have said a lot about what kind of systems we are delivering or NATO allies are, are, are delivering. So uh, again, uh, the important thing is that NATO allies are providing uh, uh, significant military support. Uh, uh, to Ukraine, uh, but also uh, humanitarian support, financial support, and lethal and non-lethal support. Uh, we have done that for many years, uh, and allies have now stepped up. Um, <clears throat> uh, then, the, the, what, what is important to also underline is that um, NATO allies provide support to Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, NATO's uh, main responsibility is to protect and defend all allies. And, uh, and to prevent this uh, uh, conflict from escalating to a full-fledged war uh, between uh, NATO and, uh, and Russia. And uh, that's the reason why we also uh, uh, are focused on how to uh, manage uh, the risk of escalation. Uh, and also to send a clear message that we are there to defend and protect all allies, uh, not to provoke a conflict, but to prevent a conflict. And the reason why we have, over the last weeks, uh, uh, deployed 40,000 troops under direct NATO command uh, to the eastern part of the alliance and also added more uh, troops under national command, including uh, uh, more US troops in Europe. And, and this presence is to help prevent escalation of the conflict. So we are uh, preventing escalation. Uh, NATO will not be directly involved in the conflict. Uh, NATO allies will not send troops uh, or capabilities uh, into uh, Ukraine. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are providing support to Ukraine uh, in many different ways. We'll go to uh, HBO, the lady in white. Yeah. Um, uh, how the U.S. and Secretary Blinken um, have been approaching this week, and why is um, a long call for this war an assumption? Why not just do everything you can now while Russia retreats? So the easiest way to end this war is for President Putin to pull back all his troops and to end the war and to sit down and engage in, uh, in serious uh, uh, diplomatic efforts to find a solution. Uh, but we need to be realistic and we have no indications that uh, President Putin has uh, changed his over, uh, uh, overall goal and that is to uh, control uh, Ukraine and to and to uh, achieve significant military victories on the battleground. So uh, we don't see a Russian retreat. Why we, what, what we see is a Russian regrouping and repositioning of their forces, uh, moving out of uh, northern uh, Ukraine, uh, but at the same time moving those forces to the east. And we expect a big uh, battle uh, in Donbas, a big Russian offensive. Uh, and that's the reason why allies also highlighted today the urgency of uh, providing more uh, support uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. And that was also the message, of course, from uh, Minister uh, Koleba. Um, so uh, uh, that's also the reason why we need uh, to, of course, work for uh, a quick end to this war. And that's the reason why also allies are imposing heavy costs on, uh, on President Putin and uh, Russia. Uh, but at the same time, be prepared for a long haul. This war may uh, last for uh, weeks, but also months, and uh, uh, possibly also for years. And therefore, we need to prepare for a long haul. Imedi in green. 
Thank you so much. Mr. Secretary General, you mentioned a strategic concept uh, 2030, which will be a roadmap for these organizations. That's why this uh, document is very, very important for Georgia. Uh, what should we expect? I mean, open door po about open door policy, about the future of aspirants. And can you tell us more about a uh, meeting with Georgian uh, Foreign Affairs Minister? Thank you so much. The Georgian Minister of Foreign Affairs attended the meeting today, uh, and for me it was a pleasure uh, to meet him and to, and to talk to him. Uh, we had also a bilateral uh, meeting, and, uh, and I think it is important that uh, uh, we have close contacts with uh, Georgia and also the new uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, that demonstrates the strength and the importance of uh, the partnership between Georgia and, uh, and uh, NATO, and uh, we also um, um, uh, are working on how to further strengthen our partnership, including uh, by um, uh, improving and strengthening uh, the package we have already agreed, and to add uh, more to that package, including uh, issues related to secure communications, resilience, and cyber. So we uh, um, look into how we can further strengthen both the political and the practical cooperation and partnership with, with uh, Georgia. Well, in the strategic concept, uh, uh, that will be agreed in, uh, at the uh, summit in Madrid, but I expect the Allies will agree that uh, NATO's door remains uh, open, and also that the Allies will agree on the importance of further strengthening uh, to work with partners, including those partners like Georgia, who, uh, which are under pressure uh, from uh, Russia, and, uh, and to step up uh, their cooperation and, uh, and support to, to those partners. Vegan. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, we just heard uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba here offering an understanding with NATO that if you support us with all we need, we shall fight for our security, but also their security, or, that is NATO security, so that President Putin cannot test Article 5. Is that also NATO's understanding after this meeting? Well, our understanding uh, and the message from all allies are, is that we are ready, uh, and NATO allies uh, are ready to provide support to Ukraine and also provide more support. And uh, uh, allies uh, recognize the urgency of uh, providing more uh, support. Uh, and that was the main message uh, from uh, allies uh, today. Uh, at the same time, of course, NATO has a core responsibility to ensure uh, uh, collective defense to, the, to ensure a credible uh, deterrence. Uh, and we have done that uh, uh, for more than 70 years. Uh, but after the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014, we have significantly stepped up our presence in the eastern part of the alliance. We tripled the size of the NATO response force. For the first time in our history, we deployed combat ready troops to, to the east, uh, eastern part of the alliance. Uh, and, uh, and we have uh, increased defense spending across uh, uh, the alliance. And then, uh, after the second invasion, after what we saw on the 24th of February, six weeks ago from uh, today, um, uh, we have uh, further stepped up with uh, thousands of more troops, backed by uh, substantial naval and air capabilities. So, so, so uh, we uh, uh, are ensuring a credible deterrence, and at the same time, uh, supporting Ukraine, because uh, Ukraine, of course, the bravery, the courage, the, uh, the commitment, both of the Ukrainian armed forces, but also the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian uh, political leadership, um, have inspired us all, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it is extremely important that we continue to support them. Okay, Rai. Thank you. Marilu Lucrezio Rai. Secretary General, what is the risk for NATO if the war will be very long? Thank you. If the war is going to drag on and be long, uh, then the risk is first and foremost for the people uh, of Ukraine, who will suffer more, who will see more damage, more death and more destruction. Uh, so uh, this is first and foremost a tragedy for them and the responsibility for President Putin to end this war, to withdraw its troops and uh, engage in uh, serious uh, political efforts to find a political uh, settlement. But of course, as long as the war continues, uh, there will be a risk for escalation beyond Ukraine. 
And that's exactly what NATO is focused on, uh, is to prevent that escalation. And we are focused on uh, 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 prevention or to prevent escalation, uh, partly by uh, um, making sure that allies uh, uh, deliver the same message and stay united, uh, but also by increasing the presence uh, in, the, in the eastern part of the alliance in particular. Um, we have done a lot already, but at the summit we had um, recently here in Brussels with all the NATO heads of state and government, the heads of state and government uh, agreed to ask our military commanders to provide options for more longer term uh, uh, changes in our military posture uh, to to, to address the long-term effects of this war. Because regardless of whether this war ends within weeks, months, or years, it will have long-term effects on our security, uh, on uh, the way NATO, NATO needs to respond and ensure continued collective defense and uh, safety and security for NATO allies. Okay, thank you very much. This is all we have time for. Thank you.